but the church contains the Holy Ghost. It was purchased with the blood of Jesus himself and in the eyes of God. We are pure gold. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're pure gold. This church is gold. And look who was standing in the midst. I saw seven golden lamps, actually the Greek says. And in the very midst, the Greek word meson, which means in the very gut of a thing, in the very gut of it, not on the exterior, not far, but right in the very middle of it, I saw one like unto the Son of Man. Like unto means in one way it looked like him, but yet in another way it didn't look like him. The word like unto refers to the outward form. Je John remembered the outward form of Jesus. He could see that this looked like Jesus, but yet there was something so different from what he recalled about Jesus. And then he begins to describe the specific characteristics that he saw or observed in the exalted Christ. And I want you to see this. Let's look at it. Are you ready? And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, or lamps, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword in his countenance, was as the sun shineth in all of his strength. But notice back in verse 13, he said, one like unto the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the foot. Now, as you look at this list, there are things which are much more visible or prominent than that. For instance, it immediately says he had about the paps a golden girdle Huh, that's pretty noticeable, very impressive. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword. You would think that these would have been the features which John would have described first. But it's not what he saw first. What he saw first in this progressive revelation was he saw Christ dressed in a garment down to the foot. And I covered this in the service this morning. This is exactly a description of the garments which were worn by the priests described in Exodus chapter 28. They wore a garment down to their foot. Their feet were not covered, and they wore no shoes because they walked in the Holy of Holies. They walked in the very presence of God, and therefore they wore nothing upon their feet because you are not to wear shoes, according to the Old Testament, when you come into the presence of God. You're not to carry the filth of the world into that place. It shows that Jesus was completely free of contamination. And now we find as he stands in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, though he sees everything about them, to all seven churches he said, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I explicitly know everything about you. How did he know? He was standing in the midst like a bishop. He was overseeing them. But now we see he does not come first as a judge. At first, he appears as a priest hovering over his church to make intercession for them. And when you come to chapter 2 and verse 1, you find he's not even standing in a stationary position. It says he walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Jesus doesn't just stay in one spot. He is literally walking among these candlesticks, observing, looking, examining everything that is happening in the midst of them, walking in his high priestly gown. But then it immediately says, gird about the paps with a golden girdle. I know the word paps is a weird word. But it describes the upper chest. Kings wore girdles. Usually kings wore them around the waist. 
and their garments would be gathered up in a way so that when they walked, their lower garments would flow majestically. But the more powerful you were, the more higher you lifted that belt. The higher the belt, the greater was the sweeping action of the garment. And now we find Jesus doesn't have a belt around his waist, not even around his midriff, but around the paps. It's all the way around the top. So now we see, secondly, he is revealed as a king, not just a king, but a majestic king. And as he walks, his garment is moving in a sweeping, majestic fashion. And the belt, which is wrapped around his chest, is made of pure gold. Very few kings were able to afford pure gold belts around their being. In fact, usually their belts were made out of beads with all kinds of ceramic and glass, maybe a mixture of gold, but very rarely was there ever a belt made of pure gold. This would require the most powerful and the most majestic king. And therefore, when John saw Jesus, first of all, he saw that this was his great high priest. Secondly, he saw not only was Jesus a high priest, but because of the position of his golden sash, he understood Jesus was the real king. This was the most majestic king of all kings. And then, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. Well, it would have been natural to look from that golden chest right into his face, but couldn't look into his face because his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. The same phrase was used to describe Jesus in his transfiguration. And when you read it in the Greek, it describes the blinding effect of snow in the middle of the afternoon when suddenly the sunlight shines upon it and you can't look because the sight of the sun on the snow is so blinding. This was nearly a blinding look. Jesus was so white, was so glorious. And the whiteness would refer to antiquity and to his purity, absolute purity. So now John sees him as a high priest. John sees him as a majestic king. And John sees him in his purity and in blinding glory. Next it says, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. It doesn't say his eyes were fire. It says his eyes were as. The Greek means like, similar to, had the same effect as a flame of fire. Now, I don't know about you, but I have seen some paintings that people have tried to do of this. It's very difficult to paint this. And people have tried to paint pictures of Jesus with fire burning in his eyes. And it's very strange to see this. <laughs> but it doesn't say his eyes were fire. It says they were similar to. They had the same effects as not even fire. But what? A flame of fire. How many of you have sat and looked in the fireplace for a long time? What happens when you sit and look at fire? You look at all the flames as they twist and they turn and they bend and they arch and they intersect. It is so amazing to look at a flame of fire. In fact, I know we're probably not supposed to use this word in our circles, but in a certain way, fire has a hypnotic effect. The longer you look at fire, it's like you are drawn into the flames. And have you ever noticed how you could just sit and stare at fire for the longest period of time? There is intelligence in fire, the way that it moves and interacts. There's beauty in fire. And John said, when I looked at his eyes, and you know what the Greek says? The Greek says, when I looked at the eyes of him, he was totally pulled into these eyes. He saw something in these eyes that he had never seen before. The eyes of him, uniquely different than any eyes that he had ever seen before. The eyes of him 
were like a flickering flame of fire. John is describing the effect of seeing into his eyes, the intelligence in his eyes, the knowledge in his eyes, the life in his eyes, until Jesus was, until John was nearly mesmerized, totally captivated, totally taken by the look in his eyes. Then he says, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Well, remember he had on no shoes because he is also our high priest. And yet his feet, this word feet is the word podos. It describes bare feet, unclothed feet. Like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And if you study what the scholars say about this, they're all confused about it because the Greek word is so strange that is used here. The word is impossible. It is the word kalkos, which is the word for bronze, the same word used in the Old Testament for judgment. So the use of this word kalkos, here translated brass or bronze, would indicate judgment on the feet of Jesus. But yet the second part of this word is the word libanos. And the word libanos, this is what is so strange, is the Greek word for frankincense. So now we find an alloy of metal and frankincense. Those things don't mix. They simply don't mix. Bronze and frankincense, they don't mix together. So what in the world is this? And the majority of scholars will try to tell you this and try to tell you that. And basically at the end, they'll tell you, it's very hard to have any idea what this means. <laughs> now, I don't know if the Hammonds have any bronze pieces in your house. But Denise and I have some bronze pieces. I love art. And bronze is very heavy. It's very heavy. In the middle of our TV room, we sit on our couch. We have our big centerpiece table. What's that called? Coffee table? Big, big coffee table. And on the other side of it is the big shelf where we have our TV. And Denise and I sit together in the same place every day. We read together. Sometimes we watch Christian TV together. It's not very often, but sometimes we do. But there's something that obstructs Denise's view. Because right in the middle of our coffee table, there is a bronze of a Russian bear. It's beautiful. And if I'm tired and I'm sitting there, Denise will say, honey, I can't see the TV. Would you move that bronze? If I ask Denise to move the bronze, it's quite a funny sight because she's just trying so hard to pick it up because bronze is very heavy. So the first thing we find is Jesus' feet are made of bronze. Well, just imagine suddenly that your feet were made of bronze. How fast would you move? You wouldn't move very fast, would you? In fact, you would have to think about every movement of your foot as you slowly picked it up to move in a direction. Your movement would not be hasty. It would not be rash. It would be very slow and very deliberate. So first of all, we know that his feet were like bronze. Secondly, libanos, the word frankincense, it describes like glowing in a furnace. It's just a bad translation. It describes the hue of frankincense. Jesus' feet carried the hue of frankincense, which was used in the Holy of Holies. It was used in the temple. 700 pounds of it every year was used in the temple, which tells us Jesus is not in a rush to judgment to these seven churches. He has sent a letter to all seven of them through John. But Jesus is moving so slowly and has so bathed himself in this issue. He is so saturated in prayer concerning these churches. Jesus is moving steadily in their direction, but slow enough to give them time to respond 
before he arrives with judgment. Jesus never rushes to judgment, my friends. He'll speak to you and wait to see what you do. And he'll move very slowly. We know that God's patience is amazing. Can somebody say amen to that? Yeah. Then, notice what it says next. Are you guys enjoying this? Yeah. Are you learning anything new? Yeah. Next it says, and his voice is the sound of many waters. Well, the island of Patmos was beset with a lot of storms at sea. And where John lived, the waters would have just reverberated right up into that cave. And when John heard his voice, he said, wow, it's so overpowering. I don't know if you have ever been to the sea in the middle of a storm, but when you're near the sea in the middle of a storm, you can't hear anything else. You can scream at the person standing next to you. They can't hear you because of the sound of many waters. And now we find that when Jesus speaks, no other voice can be heard. Verse 16. And he had in his right hand, what? Seven stars. Does anybody recall the name of the emperor who sent John to the island of Patmos? Domitian. Domitian believed that he was God. In fact, he believed that he was Jupiter. Zeus. He believed he was Zeus. He was so convinced that he was Zeus, he built statues of himself all over the empire, and he was called Domitian Jupiter. He had a child that died. And when the child died, he declared that his dead son had become his universal co-ruler. Are you all with me? His universal co-ruler. And in Asia Minor, where John lived, where he was arrested, in the city of Ephesus, there was a massive temple to Domitian. It was massive. In fact, the head of Domitian from that temple still exists in the Museum of Ephesus. If you were to set it in front of me, the head would be as big as the floor to the top of my head, just the head of this idol. So in Ephesus, everyone was compelled to worship Domitian. And Domitian minted a coin. And on one side of the coin was the head or the bust of Domitian. On the other side of the coin was a picture of his dead son sitting on a planet playing with seven stars indicating that his dead son and he, on both flip sides of the coin together, had mastery of the universe. His delusions of grandeur were so huge, he went beyond the earth. He was now the Lord of the universe with his dead son. And every time somebody went to the store in Ephesus to buy a loaf of bread, and they pulled out a coin to buy that bread, guess what they saw in their hands? Well, there's just two choices. They either saw the head of Domitian or on the flip side, his dead son playing with seven stars. Now as John is having this revelation, it's Domitian that has sent him to this island. It's Domitian that is causing the church to suffer. It's Domitian who claims to be God. And now Jesus speaks in language which John especially will understand. In the midst of this revelation, it is almost like Jesus says, Oh yeah, and John, let me show you something. He pulls out his hand, and in his hand are seven stars which meant to John, if you want to know who's really calling the shots in the universe, is not that wicked ruler who sent you here or his dead son. I am the one who is Lord of the universe. Everybody say, Jesus is Lord of all. Isn't that amazing? 
John knew immediately what that was. He didn't need an explanation. And I was going to show you, I'll pull a bit Billy Brim. You know, Billy's always showing you something from a book. <laughs> There's a picture of the coin with his dead son and the seven stars. Then, next it says, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Well, we think that this is a sword like from the Middle Ages. But in fact, it is the Greek word ramphaya, which was a Thracian sword. It was not even a Roman sword. It wasn't a Greek sword. It was a Thracian sword. Oh, the Thracians were awful. Awful, awful, awful. They were brutal killers. And ramphaya sword, which is what this is, it's the Greek word ramphaya, didn't describe a sword like we normally think of, but it was a sword that was very long, in fact, it was a pole, and on the end of the pole was attached something that looked like the sickle that you would use if you were out harvesting wheat. And it was sharpened on both sides. And this sword was used for hacking. Not for slicing, not for cutting, for hacking. That's why it was on the end of a pole. People feared this. It's one reason that the Romans had to work so hard to develop their armor because they could not resist the hacking action of the Thracian sword. And that is what's coming out of the mouth of Jesus. You would use this to touch your enemy without getting up close. And the word sharp is the Greek word axus. The word axus, same word in Russian, by the way, describes... I forgot that word in English. No, no, no. What did they give you when you have surgery? They give you an anesthetic. It is the Greek word for an anesthetic. Even back in those days, before they would perform surgery on you, they would give you something to anesthetize you so that you don't feel the pain of the surgery. So now we see that Jesus is coming, and in some of these churches, there really is some spiritual sickness. Thyatira is very sick. The church of Pergamum has great sickness. And now we find that Jesus in all of his holiness, he won't even get close to some of this spiritual, spiritual error. So he comes with an instrument long enough to touch it, but that he doesn't have to touch it himself. And because Jesus loves the church and doesn't want to hurt anybody, he comes with oxus, which is the effect of the Holy Spirit to anesthetize us before he begins the process of slicing away at those things which need to be changed in our heart. How many of you ever noticed that about the Holy Spirit, that he will prepare your heart, that he will soften the blow and then slice? I think that's powerful. Jesus is going to extract the disease. But first, he will give us what we need to know the pain. And this hacking action was important because Jesus had told, for instance, the Nicolaitans, I've got some serious things about you guys. And if they didn't repent and get in order, there would be some hacking that was going to take place. Jesus was going to remove these elements from the church. I'm telling you, friends, we need to be careful that we don't teach compromise. It's a serious thing in the mind of Jesus. It's disease. And his countenance, that refers to his face, was as the sun shineth in his strength. That doesn't need any elaboration. Verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. The word fell means to collapse as though the strength completely went out of him. The word dead is the Greek word nikras. It's where you get the word for a corpse. In fact, it is so much the word for a corpse that there are some theologians who have insinuated John may have actually died and had a resurrection here. I don't think you can prove that from the text, but it is the word nikras. He fell like a dead man. The life went out of him. And notice what it says next. And he laid his right hand upon me and I ask you to underline this next statement. Saying unto me. Notice, it doesn't say, and he said to me, but what? 
saying unto me? Fear not. I am the first and the last. When John sees Christ in all of his glory, and we don't know how long this took place. The Bible doesn't tell us. When his mind tried to comprehend everything that he was seeing, and when his being became so saturated by the glory of God that was emanating from this exalted Christ, when John saw him, he collapsed as one dead. And he laid his right hand upon me. This word laid means to tenderly lay. Saying unto me, fear not. The Greek is a participle. And here we see the picture of Jesus. Great Jesus, exalted Jesus, all-powerful Jesus, ruler of the universe, majestic king, high priest, in all of his glory, all of his power. In order for him to lay his right hand upon John, who has collapsed, Jesus has to bow. And Jesus bows and tenderly places his hand upon him. John said, saying unto me, fear not. The Greek participle literally means, and he kept saying and saying and saying and saying, hey, hey, fear not, hey, hey, hey. Almost as though you would reach out to shake somebody or to get their attention or to try to make them not be afraid. He kept on saying to me would be a better translation. Hey, it's going to be all right. Don't fear. Fear not, fear not. And the words fear not are exactly the same words which Jesus used throughout his earthly ministry when he would say, fear not, fear not, fear not. Even though Jesus looked different, there were elements that were exactly the same. His outward appearance was glorious. It was grand, almost beyond description. But his voice was the same. His compassionate touch was the same. His word to his disciples, fear not, was the same. And we find Jesus touching John, touching him, shaking him, saying and saying, hey, 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 fear not. Hey, fear not. Fear not, fear not, until finally John is roused. And Jesus next says, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives. Their Greek literally means perpetually lives forevermore. And was dead. Now, isn't that interesting? Was dead. The word was literally means death was a brief interruption in my eternal life. <laughs> I was dead. It was just a brief interruption. But I am alive perpetually forevermore. And then Jesus says, and behold, I am alive forevermore. That word behold is not translatable. Every place you use it in the New Testament, it's really not translatable. So the King James translators translated it behold. But you know what it is? The closest translation you can come to it, and even this fails, is wow. When Jesus said to the disciples, behold, I give you authority over all the works of the enemy, it's the same word. Jesus was so impressed with it. Jesus said, and wow, am I ever giving you authority over the works of the enemy? When Jesus said, behold, I'm sending the Holy Spirit, and wow, if you only understood what I was sending to you. It's the expression that someone would use when they are so excited they don't know how to express themselves. And now when Jesus talks about his return from the interruption of death and says, behold, I'm alive forevermore, it is literally, and wow, listen to this, death will never get me again. I am perpetually, eternally alive. Wow. And then we see 
Jesus is excited at his own preaching <laughs> because Jesus says amen. <laughs> and have the keys of hell and of death. Hell is the word Hades, describes the underworld, everything dark, everything demonic. Death being the final frontier. He has already crossed it. He has already passed it. He's got the keys to hell and death. Now go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm closing. How does it begin? What's the first two words? Then what does it say? The revelation of Jesus Christ. You can talk about all the beasts in the book of Revelation. The city on seven hills. All of those things and all of them are important. They're part of this. But when John walked away from this experience, the thing that impacted him the most is what he wrote in the opening statement. This was the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The year 95. John, probably in his mid-90s, he had been waiting more than six decades to see Jesus again. Finally, he saw him. But what he remembered and what stood in front of him had radically changed. It wasn't a new Jesus. It was just a Jesus so glorious it couldn't be revealed any time earlier. Yeah. 